Okay, here we are again on Sunday, the 7th of April with the Integral Community Chat. And today, actually, we would go ahead with the levels of development and talk about green. But before we do that, I would like to address something which I would call talking about shared leadership. As we had an occasion last time that after a while I felt that I have to interfere and say, stop, we have to do something else. And what I would like everybody not to wait for me that I have to do it. I mean, I'm in beginning the calls and I will end them because it uh, was my idea and it's my channel and so on. Yeah. But all the rest, I would like to share leadership with you. So when you feel that something is going in a way, some, somebody's going off topic or somebody's pitching their services and wants to sell us something, you know, or going off topic, really off topic. Sometimes we need to go off topic in the sense to then explain something and make the curve and come back to the topic, you know, so that's, that's clear. But when it goes definitely somewhere else and it takes all the energy away so that you can notice it too and say, hello, how, or as I said, this or in other groups, they have this as a sign. That means it's enough. Stop for a moment. And this is one thing. The other thing is, I think we could even do better in being more integral in these calls. One of it is uh, what Natalie has suggested. I don't know if you hear us, Natalie, uh, to do something. Yeah, okay. Uh, with the body uh, as some, or some meditation or something at the beginning, which brings us in the same field. And when it is needed then in disturbance moments that we come, take the time and come back in the, into the same field, we space, you can call it. And uh, in the past, we already agreed on that, Natalie, but then I forgot. So it would be shared leadership that you remind me, or you say, stop, we wanted to do that, you know, because otherwise I'm sort of a boss and I don't want to be a boss. I don't want to be completely green as the topic is of today, but I only don't want to be the one who decides and has to interfere. And you know, sometimes it's really difficult. I'm, I'm not very much um, conflict um, feel, how do you say? I don't love very much conflict, you know, and so I try also to wait and wait and wait and wait. And so it would be nice if uh, everybody who feels the similar things uh, uh, expresses when it's the right moment uh, that too. Okay, I think that's more or less what I wanted to say. And with that, Natalie, I would invite you to to do a minute or so uh, of of something which you think can bring us together. And uh, by the way, other suggestions are welcome. You know, and write it on the on the on the um, Damiano uh, website, on the Damiano forum. So we have all that together. So we don't have to to exchange emails, which then get lost somewhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Heidi. It's, it is lovely to, to share leadership in that way. And um, so I'll start off with a little bit of body practice. And since the, the topic of uh, today is green, um, and for me, green is, um, some of it is about developing a sense of emotional intelligence. And I find that emotional intelligence can best be accessed through body sensation, um, really understanding how how are things arising? Where are they arising? What direction do they have in the texture? What are they communicating? And so um, I'd like to invite us to start off with a little bit of a body scan. Um, start with finding your breath. Uh, you can sit with eyes open or closed. And um, we'll do this body scan and then transition into a, just a little bit of movement. We'll start the day off. So as you sit and Find your breath. Notice where do you notice sensation in breath first? Is it in your nose or in your lungs, maybe your belly? Great. 
and take three big exhales to release any tension from the night before and from the morning or here it's morning maybe from the day for you if you're in Europe. Big full exhales all the way empty. And now that we've reset our energy to some degree, start to notice the sensations anywhere in your body, whether it's your shoulders, is there tension there? Or your hips, or your legs? Whatever sensations jump out first. And as you notice, See if you can name the texture that's happening there. Is it wound up or is it diffuse? Is there a gridlock or a, maybe a spring-like tension? And then take your hand and give that area a little bit of extra support. A little bit of extra attention and intention with your hand. Notice, is there any sense of direction or something that those textures are communicating? Do those textures want to move up or down in your body, maybe out or in? Do they want to become more still or more active? And so this is one of the ways that the sensations in our body can communicate emotions through the direction. What does that texture want to do, its natural impulse? And then we can relate it to emotion, the textures that emotions have. And we can even start to clear them a little bit with some tapping with your hand. And um, actually the way that I like to start out is just with a little bit of massage to that area to kind of move it around in your body. And then you can either tap to reset the immediate area and then the surrounding area, or you can brush, brush it off like you're brushing dust off of your shoulders, or your pants. And we'll finish with a little bit more vigorous brushing and tapping all over the body, resetting. This has a scientific effect of resetting our chemistry, squeezing out the fluid from our fascia, and an energetic effect of clearing some of the stuck patterns. And as you come back into the room, start to open your eyes. They're not already open. And we'll join each other here for our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. And I feel already in a different space, so thank you. Okay, green. We know that well in all its forms. <laughs> and I think everybody has a story to tell. Okay, who wants first? 
because so uh, p uh, on the own stories and also the characteristics which we say in green the healthy forms and the unhealthy forms and maybe connected with the story i um, will gleefully jump in um i grew up so green um although my father was a scientist uh, very orange and i don't think we stressed the positive of orange enough the last time but that's not for today so i want to start by singing green the positive and then my experience of why i felt so allergic to it for most of my life and how i'm now coming back to green these last few years with a new appreciation for it now that i have a foothold outside of it i can see how beautiful and necessary it is i grew up unitarian universalist uh, my mother took me off to the Unitarian Church every Sunday, and that is about as green as it gets. Um, and the, the social justice warriors, I mean, God bless us all. I mean, dedicating our attention and energy to bringing back the marginalized people in and seeing that they have an equal share and an equal, at least an equal chance. Um, pain in our own bodies, pain at the horrors and injustices of the world, at the young black men who get shot by police for being in their own apartments, uh, for the people in Syria who are living in this, it, it just, just life is uh, unbearable for the people in Venezuela. Uh, Unitarians helped start the ACLU back in the day, they helped start the Red Cross. And by, but by the time I was in high school, I started itching. I mean, I think I had astral hives or something it's i remember this one guy in my church who wore this button that said i am white i am not proud you know, that was in the days of the black panthers which is you know, just over the hill in oakland i mean we we're really we're ground zero for this and i remember thinking what's wrong with this picture why doesn't everybody get to be proud we all get to be proud of what we genuinely are and and I just and then I went off to college in Berkeley. <laughs> I've lived most of my life in Berkeley, and and I've had this kind of wincing ugh, irritation at the excesses and negativities of green, and so I just kind of unplugged from that and I started meditating and I've been reading Ken Wilber since 1982. I think I've read just about every book of his as it's come out. And so having kind of I hope if I'm not kidding myself. Um, as I'm establishing myself more in second tier, I can come back and see the wonders of green. And in the last two years, I've gone back and rejoined the Unitarian Universalist Church here in Berkeley. In the wake of the 2016 election of Donald Trump, I felt like, you know, I've let them, you know, other people are taking care of all the social stuff, the social justice stuff. I can do my humanities nerd thing. Um, but now I, f I, f I feel in the last three years, <clears throat> I feel a, a need to be part of the social justice, <clears throat> excuse me, part of where we want to go next, which is, you know, second tier, the third tier, and so on, but to consolidate the healthy green that's helping take us there. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Well, I, I like the story and um, I like this stage. Uh, um, it's really it might be the stage that I really came alive with life. Um, <clears throat> because um, first of all, I wasn't aware the stage was in until I discovered Wilbur a few years ago that uh, there is such a thing as a stage because the um, <clears throat> qualities in it, you know, the emotional um, connection, uh, which I, in my recovery work, had to do work on because it was really in an earlier stage, um, uh, younger stage, um, I was Alex um, I really couldn't, had no language for um, emotions at all. And um, <clears throat> I also, um, um, since the, the, the lack of language for visual, uh, but anyway, it awakened the senses, the, um, the multiple intelligence uh, qualities in me uh, as I engaged in the whole movement, because it was part of the movement in the 60s um, <clears throat> as a full-blown rebel, you know, we occupied, you know, university buildings, you know, and I was in the days of rage out in Chicago, you know, and I was down in the civil rights movement down in North Carolina, you know, I mean, it was just a glorious wonderful time of just 
pushing against the uh, orange and, uh, uh, forces at, at, uh, in power at that time. And, um, but it, it, was, it was like, it just brought my whole being alive, especially with, with, with all in the body. I think someone said last week, I loved it, um, you, know, you know, embodiment or instead of mindful, bodyful. You know what I mean? It just resonated for me. So um, to have that language by reading uh, Wilbur in the sense that it's the stage that I was going through and awakening to, because the other side of it was that in the last 10 years, I started to uh, become a little bit disenchanted with the, um, the green, um, because it, 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 I think because uh, what I saw is amorality. I mean, my um, response to the um, seven countries that my country has invaded and destroyed uh, in the Middle East, uh, some ways really impact me deeply. And I feel it and I feel the, and I like that the fact that I'm that global conscious and even cosmic uh, connected to the suffering um, of those people. Um, it's just that I, around me, there wasn't getting any responses. You know, it's kind of like a weather report if you mention about Palestinian teenagers being gunned down, things like that. And that kind of perplexed me that is there something lacking of where we move towards? Um, and then, like I said, to be aware that people in different stages and different consciousness and different levels and that um, green is a, a different consciousness, um, uh, that, that was, that's very helpful uh, to understand that and to be able to find a language for it and expressing it. Um, but the thing I've heard in this movement or this uh, perspective, the integral, is that this perplexed me, and I'm hoping today to, to learn more because I'm open-minded to it, is the uh, criticism of green, um, um, if it's absolutist, I, I, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm old for that because uh, I like to be moving more and more towards the integral, integral perspective where everyone's right and it's a truth that everyone has. I just love that concept. And um, the thing is, is when I was in the movement, the concern about equality as an equal opportunity versus equal outcome, as Wilbur talks about, uh, that understanding green is equal um, outcome. Uh, we actually had big struggles in Chicago and the conventions I was involved with of uh, forces that believe that uh, quota system, which is really about equal outcome, uh, versus creating the conditions, structurally transformational shift, and awakening or consciousness raising all that, those forces believed in the equal opportunity. So I don't know if that relates to the formation of green, but historically it didn't start out that way, that there were forces that really believe like I do, which I'm glad that uh, now I have a little more clarification about the distinction between those two, because for me, the equal opportunity uh, to me is more valid um, or more expensive that is. Uh, for growth and development for everyone. Uh, then saying this, we in fact called it, because we had a leftist uh, um, uh, um, tend to our thinking or the people I was with, uh, that we're very bourgeois, you know, to think that everyone's got to be the same uh, kind of thing. And then the other part, which I, again, was confused about with critiquing Green, was the, um, the uh, oppression, you know, that hierarchism is by nature oppressive. Uh, from um, I wasn't aware of, of, of that being a, a, a big um, issue. And because I know in the movements was involved with, even though we weren't doing well with uh, a wider distribution of people in the authority position as being also of women and black, but the concern was there about how we could create the conditions for more um, diversification of people in decision making or leadership position and all of that. But, but he, and we were against the quota system because we felt that was just very mechanistic and all that. But I, we never, never heard the idea that hierarchicalness by definition is oppressive. And I think because we were more leftist biased in the sense that the ruling class by its commitment to profit making, you know, uh, that they would by, by definition be oppressive, but not because it's hierarchical, 
So, so I find the, that discussion uh, um, fascinating, and also I don't know how I missed it it being something that emerged in the green uh, uh, um, state of development. But I would love to hear some spins on that today uh, because um, I definitely want to be more expansive and integral. And I wish I could be here next week to hear this discussion. But thank goodness it's videotaped so I can hear it because uh, I have to work next uh, Sunday. Uh, that, um, uh, like, like I say, uh, this is this really brought me alive because I have a history of three suicide attempts, and I didn't good, didn't good, couldn't do a good job at that. So the fact that I some way grew into green was really a very saving, great situation for me. Um, but to be able to recover the different stages uh, has, has been great too. Uh, so that I hopefully I'm not absolutist about. Uh, um, being more recently, uh, it, you know, into, into green. But like I say, the morality uh, intelligence level, um, you know, um, still bothers me because it seems to me the uh, green forces are not picking up any universality. And I understand better now why by, by the uh, learning uh, from Interco. Um, but um, it's kind of a mixed blessing to understand green because <laughs> Even though it's been for me a lifesaver, it's also uh, the fact of being critiqued. I find that exciting because expand expanding is what really gets me off. Thank you. Could I um could I make a suggestion? I'm not sure if this fits into the 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 group call, but I was wondering about um sort of focusing on the positive and the negative, like separating those two as a point of conversation might be like. Uh, like my intuition is that it might be a little bit like more cohesive or um um yeah more useful yeah maybe more coherent i didn't quite get it you want to separate that um yeah like i, I don't know if this is the right time like because if we we're supposed to be talking about green or the way that we talk but like um it seems like there's quite an obvious division in the topic between the good and bad of each level. Mm -hmm. um, and personally, I think it's kind of like, I find it a little bit more sat satisfying just to be like, like be on one side of it rather than kind of mm -hmm. uh, bouncing between the two sort of thing. Uh, the, 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 the question I put out was, what is it in, in your experience? And so it's logical that people talk about the good side and the bad side, which they experienced. So, and I, I would, I would say they could do that, but they could do it. Yeah. They could do it for like half the call, and then um, maybe it's not the right time. Actually, maybe we okay. need. To... Do you want to 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 talk so about Queen? Um, yeah, I was just thinking, and um, I've never thought about this before. So I thought it was something that came out of the, the call. But I was like, man, if it wasn't for Green, like music would be kind of shite. Like I'm thinking of how much like music like radically changed during the '60s and stuff like this. Like there was so much incredible stuff. The amount of like cultural revolution, like sex and psychedelics, and kind of Buddhism in the East was kind of being uh, pulled over. And um, I don't know, maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I kind of remember like Elvis and some of the blues guitar was kind of starting to kick in during the 50s. But like the amount of incredible art, and people were talking about like being in touch with their emotions and their feelings and stuff like this. I think that's like really representative in the. Um, in the art of the cultural revolution, just like how much happened, like um, Karen was talking about, you know, SJ Tub, the, the social justice warrior is a kind of <laughs> insult these days. But at the time it was like, um, you know, like especially black people were kind of risking their life to stand up. You had like Malcolm X, you had Martin Luther King, you had feminism, you had people protesting about Vietnam. Um, and it was such a, such a dynamic time where people were kind of tough. Um, so yeah, I was just I was just thinking about that in um, when people were talking about about green, like the the flavor of the '60s is partially is almost like my favorite, uh, possibly my favorite time for music, but definitely my favorite time if I think about green as a whole. Just a quickie comment, um, the way I parse history, the 60s was the era when green came online as a culture as opposed to just a few pockets 
of individuals that it became a new a, 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 the leading edge of the next the next emerging era and we're now transitioning to yet another over Well, I've had some um, really interesting experiences with green, especially here in Portland. Portland is such a hub for green. And um, that's one of the reasons why I moved here initially, because I was very much so in that stage and very much in a place of um, spiritual awakening at that time and wanted to um, be able to have some of these conversations in a way where uh, people didn't look at me with a hairy eyeball without any way to comprehend some of the, the experiences I was having. But um, it turned out very differently. Um, actually, I experienced a lot of trauma in the NBC community because of the mean green meme where there was one way that you needed to talk, one way that you needed to show up. And if you didn't have the same values as the rest of the group, then um, it felt like um, an implicit expectation to process about it forever until we came to the same conclusion, <laughs> um, which was just mind boggling for me. And um, so now I still have a deep appreciation for green, but um, I have such a desire to move to a more conservative city actually. I feel like I can be more myself now that I know and understand more about myself, understand more about the, the green level. Um, and I can bring that to, to different communities. Um, but something that's particularly interesting about um, green for me to explore is how green layers with the other stages because it has so many of them under its belt. And um, I find there's very different flavors of green when it's mixed with like blue or orange. And it's rare to find someone that's really just in green stage without shadow in those earlier earlier stages and lots of combination. Um, I find that the mean green meme comes from that um, like shadow in blue in some form um, and shadow in red in some form and um, hmm. I have met a number of people who have like an orange green combination which has been really cool. I find that that's where like a more healthy version of the social justice warrior comes out. Um, there's, there's that emotional intelligence, there's the stability and the drive to make some of these projects happen. Um, and then I also recognize that people are in green um, in two different ways where there's a green withdrawn and green like overexpressed. And so the green withdrawn, um, imagine someone sitting on their computer looking up articles all over the internet about all of the woes of the world and the way that people are being killed in places. And um, they feel so overwhelmed and depressed by all of the um, horrible things happening that they just go into a very deep depression. And that's not the same as the mean green meme necessarily, but there's other flavors happening there versus that, that overdrawn green meme that we more commonly know in integral. So, thank you. I was just going to say, just on the back of that, like I, I think I've had plenty of experience with this in surfing as well. Like the, there's something really sweet about the way that green comes together, but they're kind of useless about like doing anything about it. Um, I was just, I remember like feeling very much like that in my sort of like halfway through therapy, like I'd really sort of gravitate to painful stuff in the world, but then it would be almost kind of just masochism because I couldn't, I didn't think of like actually doing stuff, which probably speaks to that orange or that red. And um, that's also my experience with um, the, the circling community, it's sort of um, often like frustrating wanting to, wanting to do stuff. Yeah, the green is um, it's an interesting topic to talk about. Um, there's many ways we could go with it, but I, I think for me, starting with um, appreciating 
Um, contextualizing green really beginning as a post-war turn, right? Uh, Post-World War II, trying to understand what just happened and how Europe just imploded and how Germany, which was previously sort of the seat of the image of Western civilization between, you know, the, indust the industry, the philosophy, you know, the, the, the long history of culture could produce something so monstrous. And so there was this kind of um, recoiling and, and, and deconstruction of the project of modernity itself using the tools of modernity that a lot of postmodernists describe themselves as in the modernist project. So I think this kind of um, uh, bringing to awareness through like the Frankfurt School, um, which kind of precipitated the, the 1960s and the, and the hippie turn that we, we've sort of been talking about and the kind of um, escalation of these ideas. Before that, I mean, it really was a sort of attempt and continuing through this attempt to have a deeper sense of literacy about the relationship um, human beings have in constructing power, right? And power dynamics is a kind of literacy, economic ideology as a kind of literacy. So for me, you know, at its best, green is um, self insight into the project of modernity and of, of the mental of the orange going like, hold on a second, these projects are really ambitious but there's a shadow side to them. And I, I've been talking about this with uh, different folks in the integral community. Um, and it's this kind of ambivalence of modernity that Green is so masterful at kind of turning over. Um, like, you know, I, I always bring up Paul Virilio, right? Because he talks about, this is such a perfect image. Um, he talks about how when we invent anything, any kind of new technology in this sort of ambitious project of progress, um, we also invent the catastrophe that goes along with it. So you invent the automobile, you invent the car accident, you invent the airplane, you invent all the technologies that go along with bombing, et cetera, et cetera, the, the, the plane crash. You know, so he, a lot of these thinkers have tried to integrate the shadow in a way of the light of modernity, the kind of Apollonic move towards progress and the shadow that it casts on the world. And at its best, I think, when it's doing its job, it's doing that. Um, when we get into the 1960s, the positive thing I wanna say about that, I wanna sort of stick to positives because it's so easy to, in, in some ways being very positive about green is actually better than a critique of green because it gets you right back to the healthy form that we really kind of need to orient ourselves around. So. Um, so for me, you know, in the 1960s, it was this sort of really overambitious, like right 1968 is sort of that famous year, this really ambitious sort of revolutionary year where there was so much um, uh, turmoil and, and upheaval and chaos. But then at the same time, there was a sort of utopian project, and this idea that, oh, maybe we can overthrow, you know, the empire. Maybe we can build a more egalitarian society and have world peace and put flowers in, in rifles and there was this this total openness to that new possibility and, and yes it imploded but there was this you know I, in a conversation I had with um, a, a friend and author J.F. Martel he talks about 1968 as this kind of event that's still happening in a way it has this kind of attractor and, and I think a lot of people look back to that year of 68 as this like moment of potential. And I think that's sort of the, <laughs> the positive side of it as well, of, of, of green, this moment, this, this virtual potential to transform the world into a better society. It goes wrong in a lot of ways, but man, that, that's sort of the, that's the core there for me, for, for green. And the more we can kind of bring it back online and, 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 and not be infighting and not be kind of, you know, calling each other out for things and that kind of stuff, the more we can kind of move towards that kind of shared social project, which is a kind of a modernist project too. I think the more we can kind of align with healthy, healthy green. So that's, that's, that's really it for me. Yeah, thank you. For me, green has appeared much more as an ecological concern. I remember in the 70s uh, when I was in Germany, we already talked about separating uh, the plastic out, recycling, the first attempts of recycling of plastic were made and the heightened idea of wanting to be in agreement with nature. I mean, this is also history in Germany. We had in the 19th century a movement back to nature and things. And my mother happened to be a little bit oriented. So 
it was for me the real access to green, which I always, you know, it was sort of normal for me. And then when I came to Italy, there was everything different. <laughs> and now, only a few years ago, they seem to have invented recycling or something, you know. <laughs> anyway, so for me, um, green was in some way coexistent with blue in our family. Uh, while the orange, uh, for me personally, didn't so much exist. So going ahead and be successful and all these things, only as a push, maybe. Yeah. But um, the negative parts of um, green, I experienced by my own being green and trying to be good all the time and kind. And, you know, I had a whole lot of people. I live here in this big house and I have people from all over the world and often like helpers, like boofers, I don't know if you know this, willing, work, willing workers on organic farms and also other people. They just came around uh, here and for instance, I had Uzbekans from France and I learned a lot about their culture and uh, I had also Romanians when they were still illegal and I sort of risked to have them here and I tried to find them work and here they were for, you know, uh, uh, could live for free and did some, some work. And I, for, uh, at the beginning, I gave them also a, a certain task and that was paid. And then I realized I give them so much and they don't, they don't, um, reciprocate it in, in some ways. They made uh, damage and they didn't never repair it. And when they finally, I threw them out after half a year or something, but I discovered that they took my stuff away, you know, that they stole. And I was so, so out of myself. How can they do that, you know? Use my property in a way, instead of being happy that they could be here, I risk that they, you know, <laughs> with them being here. <clears throat> And then I thought, oh, you should have known that. Because I already had uh, read the books of Ken Wilber in the stages of development. You should have known that a person in red doesn't care. They are fine with, uh, with what you give them and say, too bad for you. You know, what you give me, I take it, yeah. But giving it back doesn't even appear, you know, in, in their minds. And so I had some of these... Uh, uh, experiences with people of a lower stage of development, which doesn't mean necessarily the nationality, you know, in this case, it happened to be uh, these people. Um, so I had to learn in the hard way. Also with a, a person of Syria, an ex-husband of my sister. And then I figured out, oh, when you really do like this and, and, and become very red yourself, then they they begin to, to listen to you. And so slowly I had to learn by experience what theoretically I knew. And my greenish ideology, let's say, my utop utopianism, or how you say, led me to not see that, to not want to believe that you have to be in the world in a different way, but that you have to consider that people don't think like you think, the people don't feel like you feel, and expecting that they do, that they exchange kindness with kindness is just, you are stupid, <laughs> you know, I said to myself. So I sort of have, have learned that in the hard way, I have to say, and I'm so glad that I can see that now and that I can now by this experience uh, a little bit better evaluate uh, people uh, and don't give too much confidence in people which I shouldn't give confidence in and take over, over leadership sometimes then because in green I couldn't. I had to, to be nice and kind, you know, would you please? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. That was for me the green journey. And because of my own green um, aspirations, I was hindering myself in many ways. So also the, the, the basis is still okay. I still am, you know, I think we should be kinder with each other, but be more differentiated in that. Okay, that's me. Well, that helped me relate to that with the people my age uh, 
<clears throat> or maybe a little younger, but the baby boomers and the boomer, boomer artists uh, concept that Wilbur talks about, to understand that people that were in the 60s with, when I was with the movements and all that, uh, <clears throat> and concerned about the world we live in and all of that, and then find people of that age, um, kind of is, uh, you're me, 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 and uh, what do I care about what's happening in Libya, you know what I mean, or, or Yemen or whatever. Um, to realize the different levels, you know, that, that, that they, they, in fact, even when they were activists, they might have been still more egocentric or more, you know, you know, F your war, you know, because I want to go rather than, <clears throat> you know, F your war because it's unjust, you know, for everyone, especially the people who invaded, uh, you're being global conscious kind of like. So that helped me a lot to understand those levels about my relationship with people, especially people my age, you know what I mean? Uh, people my age, uh, they just seem to be, up here in the uh, here in the United States, they go down to Florida, you know, and playgrounds. <laughs> you know, all that and care less about what's happening in the world. And yet they were in in the marches in the '60s. You know, you know, very militant and uh, wanting to to make change, but now realizing that their motivation for change was coming from different levels. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to. <clears throat> cycle back to Jeremy because what you were saying about 1968 and all that I lived it I was um, I think 16 years old in 1968 um, um, I was 15 and for the summer of love and I was only living about 40 miles away from San Francisco so we got like this blast of energy and I this is the positive side of green and I think feel I was very fortunate I was a flower child but I was also very sheltered, protected, and naive. So I got the beautiful idealism, you know, the height of the Beatles, with our love, with our love, we can save the world without the sex and the drugs. You know, I went off to college, then later the sex and the drugs came later. But I had that beautiful idealism, the opening to the Eastern spirituality and the sitar music that the Beatles brought in. Um, um, that, that is so much a base of who I am, the beautiful idealism and the opening into these higher and higher states and stages, opening the possibilities and the potentials. And I am so grateful I have that. And that's still in my foundation as I then engaged in the world and, and got realistic, like Heidi said, you have to learn how the world real is and a wise way to be in it. Um, like be ye wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We need that both. And so, yes, I want to affirm that. And that 60s was that emerging as a culture of that green level in some very beautiful and profound ways. And now I will boomerang into the negative. As a humanities nerd, I was all set to get my PhD in cultural history and be a, be a professor at a university. But just as I was going through those later stages, the... Um, deconstructionist movement was beginning its hostile takeover of the humanities. And I, I did not know until much later that Foucault was teaching in Berkeley at Cal during those years I was a graduate student and a little later. I was assigned his one of his books, I forget which one, as one of, for one of my graduate seminars. And the only time in my life this has happened to me, I would read it because I had to read it for the seminar, and I would get about 20 pages, I would burst into tears, hurl the book across the room, bounce it off the opposite wall, and storm around the room waving my fists and yelling in fury. I mean, that book was so hard to read and so deliberately hard to read. It infuriated me, but I made it through, you know, about every 20 pages. I came close to reacting that way to one of Dan Brown's novels, but otherwise I can say this is the only time I have hurled a book across the room in rage. I did not learn until a long time later that Foucault himself was sexually a sadist. He frequented the leather bars in San Francisco during the early 80s, got AIDS, and eventually died of AIDS. And as far as this, this is my personal, very subjective reaction, but I have, I'm so grateful I did not spend my life in the humanities. I ended up marrying a doctor and withdrawing, finishing my PhD and making my living being a doctor's wife and did not have to deal with deconstructionism in the humanities. Thank you, Buddha. But I am so allergic to that aspect of the mean green meme of the deconstructionism, which is very powerfully a shadow, a red shadow, in my humble opinion, uh, per Natalie. This is part of the dark shadow of green, that red um, we will we will pound you because 
any structure is a dominator hierarchy and evil and, and we have a way to turn whatever you say against you and pound you into the dust with it. Uh, I'm so, so allergic to that. Because, you know, I came, what I came away from that at that time more innocently was just this reaction. If you really have something to say and you understand what it is, you can say it clearly and lucidly. This opaque language is a form of sadism, in my humble opinion. I'm still reacting against it. So that's, that's kind of bouncing from the beautiful positive to the beautiful negative of green, in my experience. We haven't heard from Ryan yet. I um, <clears throat> It was interesting what you were saying, Karen, because it kind of got to what I was uh, going to say, which was um, how I think a lot of times when people associate, when people talk about green, they're talking about a very specific aspect or, you know, their experience with green. And I think what you were alluding to was the role of like an ideology in shaping a cultural movement or an entire stage of development. And I said this before, but I'll just say it again. In Hawaii, at least where I'm from, on the Big Island, in the town that I lived in, there is no mean green meme at all. There is a lot of green, but there's no mean green because there's no social justice, political correctness, identity politics kind of ideology there. It's only, hey, I, I, I you know, I, I'm from somewhere else, you know, I'm from the mainland and I moved to Hawaii to work on an organic farm and swim with dolphins, go to massage school and do yoga. And so it really is like a pure green without any ideologies or without any philosophy or without any political agenda. And everyone is, it's really just, a, it's just a big like kumbaya, let me give you a hug man kind of thing. All my friends in Hawaii, my age were green. And yeah, they just, they, they really were just more like spiritual seekers and it's kind of like, you know, in the 60s, what people were talking about was kind of like the, uh, the beatniks and the Dharma bums and the, the people who couldn't cut it in cutthroat or in society. So they had to go on some kind of a quest to find themselves and to, you know, relax and to de-stress and to go sit it with, you know, doing Zen meditation and doing psychedelics and that kind of thing. That's mostly the Hawaii crowd is mostly like a hippie new age kind of a seeking thing. And there's no mean green at all. It's just everyone is really friendly. Everyone's really nice. Everyone's really inclusive. And the, the thing that interests me is how when it comes to integral stage, just to use my, my green experience in Hawaii, Hawaii as an example about how I, I think of us integral people as um, explicitly studying integral ideology and philosophy. And, and it makes me curious too, what is a, what is a person who is integral kind of like the people in Hawaii where they don't have an ideology. That's just where their heart is at and how to recognize that and how to see that too. So that's just, that's just what I'll, I'll throw in here. Um, because so often I see people associating green as being uh, inextricable from social justice kind of ideologies. But yeah, I, I kind of wanted to emphasize the more spiritual seeker um, kind of part of back to the land, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, I find those people have been, yeah, they're, they're just really nice kind of gentle people but without any red or blue, you know, uh, shadow there. So that's all I have. Um, we should have lived there, Karen. That's exactly where I wanted to live when I went down here in the countryside, you know, and this way of, yeah, sorry, I interrupted you, Nathan. Yeah, Hawaii is lovely. I've never been, but um, I'm curious, Ryan, how much of, the um, absence of the ideology, but the presence of the culture um, means that that culture is done very consciously. And the other thought paired with that that I'm having is how much um, magenta then or purple influences the green ideology. And if it is, you know, it, it has definitely green flavors, but with that purple level of um, it's just simply embodied and simply happening and there's not as much maybe self-reflexive awareness of why it's happening or um, all of those deeper layers of the emotional intelligence that give the mean green mean its structure and like a, a more concrete awareness of like world politics and the things that are happening um, rather than an implicit accepting of all the, all the all ideologies without as much consciousness. Does that make sense? Sorry, could you, could you say that again, like in one sentence? Yeah. Um, 
So two things. One is how much awareness is there around the green culture? And um, in Hawaii uh, versus when there's an ideology, there's like an explicit understanding of the awareness of uh, mm. why that's there. And the uh, influence of magenta on the way that green shows up versus the way that green shows up in other places. I don't know if this answers your question, but in my experience in, in, on the Big Island in Kona, um, people are very, very unaware of everything else happening in the world. Uh, yeah. they, don't, they don't talk about Black Lives Matter. They don't talk about police shootings. They don't talk about feminism. They don't talk about social justice issues, poverty. They don't talk about any of those things. It's all about upper left quadrant, spirituality kind of green. And, um, and yeah, they're not like woke, you know, <laughs> uh, to these kind of, and, and honestly, some of that was kind of frustrating because people, it was just like, dude, like, like, you know, talking about political issues or whatever, like the women's march. Um, and when Trump was elected, like 10 people showed up, you know, <laughs> like, did they just like, there's, they just live in a bubble. And, and, and that was, that was one of the reasons why I was excited to leave and move to Portland is because people didn't follow anything else and they didn't really know what else was happening in the world. Um, it, it was like Hawaii, the whole place is like a giant retreat center, you know, and, and where you get away from that stuff and hide in the bubble. And I couldn't stand that after a while. I need to get out of the bubble and, and spread my wings. But the, with the magenta, that's, that's hugely dovetailed with green in Hawaii because of the Hawaiian <clears throat> spiritual culture, which is also largely purple. And, and very much in the mainstream. I mean, you walk down the street and talk to people in downtown Kailua Kona, and people will start talking about Pele and the volcano goddesses and all these things. Like, it's a totally normal thing, right? If they're, especially if they're Hawaiian. And, and if you're Hali, if you're white, you know? So it, it's just like, because of, because of that particular environment too, it's like, um, there's even more of a confluency, more of a connection between purple and, and, uh, and green. Um, but, but yeah, that, uh, one of the drawbacks of not having an explicit green ideology, whether it's postmodernism or, you know, that kind of thing is, um, th what's interesting is that the lower left quadrant dominance of green as we associated or as Wilbur has articulated is really not really as present because it's, it's more like this upper left quadrant solipsism, right? Where people are just focusing on their own spiritual quest and doing permaculture and organic farming and woofing as Heidi was saying, right? And so, um, there are some social issues in, in Hawaii that I actually think that a healthy dose of social justice action would be very helpful, but no one does anything. So nothing, nothing, there are no, there are hardly any nonprofits or places that are actually doing social type of work at all. It's just, everyone's just living in their own world and they build community on a certain level, but, but not really helping people who may really need it. So that's one thing I appreciate about the more social oriented part of green in moderation is that in Hawaii, if you don't have that, it's just all upper left quadrant and no social change work. I was just thinking, um, I, I, maybe you can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, Ryan, but like I always saw permaculture as a kind of like really quite good, uh, I'm going to round it up, like, like an area that doesn't seem to have like too much kind of like negative green. Um, I was just thinking that there's something about green that like really celebrates like the innateness of everything, which I think like permaculture really does like the, the innateness of nature or the innateness of like the inner child or uh, the body. Like I think we were talking about that utopianism um, earlier of sort of like, there's something about looking back and appreciating um, what we have. And I think some of like what comes with that, like you were talking about um, people kind of just chilling out in Hawaii or um, like the present moment seems to really kind of come alive in a way at green, but there's a way of like appreciating what's here. Um, yeah. So I was just thinking about that, like in the, in reference to sort of Hawaii and permaculture and kind of how idyllic it sounds like kind of sounds a bit like the, a little bit like a slice of green utopia. <laughs> From my experience, it is like this, because in Germany, there was this movement in the 70s to go to Tuscany and to begin a new life as farmers and go away from the universities and things like that. And I'm definitely, when I came here and I had a garden also living in Berlin, 
five hours uh, of a voyage to go every weekend to my garden and things like that. And I definitely have created this around of me um, to, to be connected with nature, to be appreciating the simple life. And in those times, um, even in the 80s still, people were attracted to that, not to have all the commodities and all the, you know, uh, everything must work immediately and function. And when, uh, for instance, Mark came, my husband from America, he was looking for the button for, to, for the heating. Here's no button for the heating. You have to, to chop the wood and put it in the, in the, in the stove for when, if you want to have it warm. So I realized in the time when I was here and people coming to see me that the expectations of luxury in some way uh, is ever bigger. So that our green original ideas of living more a sustainable life, less less luxurious and reuse the things instead of throwing it away. I see myself now more or less at <laughs> the last, how do you say, the last remainder <laughs> of, this, of this movement, you know. So um, I definitely think that was a good beginning of Green to uh, value what we have and not wanting to throw it away and get some new thing immediately. So. There's, there's one thing I think that ties into this, and I remember, Karen, you just mentioning the humanities, I could feel myself getting like really pissed off, and I was thinking about, um, I think a great example of the, the good and the bad of this innateness and sort of pulling some things out of the sky and make it more immediate is the art world. That There was this big movement to be like, um, who the hell was that dude's name? The pop art fellow. Um, the a can of soup. Andy Warhol. Andy yeah. Warhol. Right. So like, you know, a can of soup could be art. It doesn't have to be like kind of uh, this really like heavy stuff. And then like now it's kind of, there's a great irony to it where it's kind of like a lot of art is, I mean, literally these days is shit. I've seen some shit in a can or like, oh, I'm going to chop a shark in half. Or there's a great irony that like one of the easiest ways to slam modern art is like some pretentious, I was going to swear, but like, you know, have, has like a white canvas and it's being sold for like $500,000 or uh, some chump gets a government grant to like make some like uh, atrocity, like like just some huge concrete block that then has this, um, like Karen, I was interested in, I, I never knew that about Foucault, but when you were talking about it, it feels like kind of sadism just to, to deal with. To me, that's a little bit like having to deal with a, a modern artist. There's kind of like this, if you can't understand my pretentious kind of maze of gibberish, then you just don't get it. And it's such a, such a like kind of emperor's clothes thing. And personally, I just, ah, oh, like one of the things like that, that is an area that just really, like really pisses me off about kind of green. Uh, I... I have to I have to put in a word for poor Foucault and and these deconstructionists for a moment just because I do think there is some merit or or some nugget in them in that um, they're doing the same thing that I was mentioning earlier just about the sort of ambivalence of the project of knowledge construction is a very abstract thing. How do we construct knowledge and what is real and and can any statement be have truth in it or have some kind of ultimate meaning with a capital, you know, truth with capital T and the, and the sort of the bringing in of this deconstructive element is really, again, to bring this kind of tentative ambivalence towards it. And it can be very frustrating to read Derrida, extremely, like uh, loops and loops and labyrinths. Um, and yet I think there's, there's a moment when you're doing that where you can kind of let go a little bit and then just start flowing with these constructions and flowing with this kind of network of ideas and not get tangled in it. And I think, um, you know, again, there, there's extremities and, and immoderate um, uh, sort of uh, exaggerated forms in academia that I think have surrounded deconstruction um, that are certainly an issue. Uh, but but as, as a kind of coming in from a slightly different angle, I would even say that the whole notion of this sort of entrenched essential identitarianism is actually not even in line with Derrida and Foucault and what they were saying, especially Derrida about identity, you know, um, or Foucault too. They, they had these kind of 
you can read, you know, the statements that social justice warrior Twitter accounts would probably hate. And they're coming from some of these sort of foundational thinkers. So there's so much nuance and I think in complexity in even those guys that I think is, is, is important. Um, and, but beyond that, because I don't even really kind of, I don't even like love those guys in terms of like, I don't, you don't find me reading Derrida for pleasure or anything like that. I'm not a, a sadist myself. <laughs> Um, but, but in terms of, um, the, the key here for me in postmodern thought is, um, I kind of view, view them as the gatekeepers, as the kind of threshold guardians into what we would say is second tier and that they have core insights that we really need to kind of go through that, that, that gauntlet. To, to to get and to receive and come out from and not stay there because I think it's easy to stay there because of how they deconstruct everything. It, it feels like there's nothing beyond that sometimes. Um, and that takes, I think, a spiritual effort, which is something that we can draw from as well. So that, that's sort of my main point. But um, the second point is, is uh, I would definitely recommend some of the more eccentric thinkers like Mark Fisher, who the social justice warriors went after as well you know and there's this whole series you can read the article on vampire castle and all that um but you know i like fisher and i like the kind of classical postmodern thinkers that are looking at economic ideology and structure because if you don't have literacy into that it's going to be very hard to make this sort of second tier turn or integral leap etc because you're going to be missing some fundamental languages to understand what's wrong with what's going on today and how we can change it so uh, i just kind of want to hold hold space for that kind of um postmodern literacy that i think is is a key fun function of this integral language that we'll need but we don't need to stay in it alone if that makes sense Jeremy, can I just ask, a, 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 I'll just put this question in really quickly and then Karen, you can go. And this is also maybe Karen, you can answer this question too, but could either one of you guys explain what Paul was saying about what happened with the art movement? Like, like postmodernism and the role of art becoming like total, sh like literally like shit. <laughs> well, I will defer the art question. There's a lot of really beautiful stuff out there too, but I would just like to really jump in with Jeremy's first point and maybe we could have fun debating this and, and um, Ryan's debate forum sometime. But yes, there was also something absolutely wonderful at the core of Foucault's book. And I'm trying to remember which specifically one I read. And he was actually analyzing a work of art, which is a Velasquez portrait of a Spanish princess. And it's a very elaborate setup where you see the painter, the canvas is as if it were a mirror. And the main, the big part is the painter kind of looking into, looking at the viewer into the mirror and the princess is actually behind him in the painting. And it's supposed to be a portrait of the print. It's a very elaborate setup I won't get to. But Foucault took us through this long, long, long with many, many, many sub loops thing and to the realization, which was very zen like, that if you really absorb what this painting is, there is neither the painter nor the painted. There is only the act of painting and it's in the viewer's face if you take it to that level and Foucault took it to that level and that was a totally zen-like transcendent realization. Now, in my humble opinion, I think we could have gone straight there with Zen with the, with the clarity all the way through. I don't think we had to go through all the S, you know, all the Shiza to get there. <laughs> to me, it was a profoundly masochistic act having to read and comprehend that book and be able to discuss it coherently in the seminar. But then in the seminar, in the art history seminar, we were able to take it to that point. Couldn't we have gotten there through Zen? But yes, and but even so, I mean, we we can have fun with this, Jeremy, on another forum. But there is that absolutely critical, those critical breakthroughs of Green through Foucault, who Foucault is an amazing pioneer. And thank you, Ken Wilber, for cutting through all the other stuff to get the essential insights. That uh, I mean, I'm just going to boil it down. Every every perception is already an interpretation. I think that is one of the key insights of Green with what that we really need to internalize as a foundation as we go into second tier and that is very much due to, to Foucault and, and the people around him. Yeah, I, I was I totally agree about about that insight, you know, that's 
in, in Gebser's approach in Integral, it's it's this kind of um, uh, perspectivalism is a sort of the nailing down of objects as essential objects that are measurable and finite and knowable, even in a kind of an abstract way, sort of like, you know, the Kantian dualism, even that, you know, you can kind of, sorry. And I, We've I'm lost plugged. you, Jeremy. Could you repeat your last few sentences? Okay. How about now? Am I back? Yep. Okay. Um, but, yeah, there, there's this loss of um, the perspectival object as a thing that we can know and measure. And suddenly the, the, the observer is getting involved in the observed and it's a sort of messy process. And um, there's this kind of unconscious dimension of that we were talking about with Foucault and power structures and institution and studying criminology. And that, that, that's how I got into it because I had to study that in, in, in sociology. Um, but I wanted to jump to your question about art, actually, um, and and how we got there. You know, I, to, to some degree, the the, the shiza, the, the shit is is intentional. You know, like the the uh, Ducamp toilet bowl thing was was an intentional kind of rebellion against beauty, as it has been understood in the classical, you know, in the sort of the classical theories of aesthetics and beauty and so on, and the kind of Greek you know, Hellenistic sense. So I, I can, I kind of see it as de deliberately stinking up the, the art gallery kind of quite literally for this sort of turn. But, you know, I think you're right that, that um, the high and the low art as, as a function sociologically is, is gone, you know, like, yeah, we still have this sort of classist upper echelon, you know, lower East side Chelsea, you know, in New York and Soho where the art, you know, the art is being sold for, tons and tons of money and outrageous but but I think art in general and electronic culture has become much more there's no up and down anymore you know art is pop culture is 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 media can be anything any any kind of bricolage can be transformed and metamorph metamorphized into art and that's the idea of remix culture that's a very postmodern idea we don't really ascribe that to it but you know uh, William S. Burroughs was doing the cut-up method and bringing things together before as a kind of harbinger to this sort of remixing and sort of networked art. So I think that's a, that's kind of at the core of it if we kind of get to it. Um, but I think, you know, having more integral perspective and sort of understanding the, the aperspectivity of things, the relationship between things, and kind of moving into those spaces um, gets us sort of out of the, I don't know, the toilet bowl kind of art thing and kind of sees where it was necessary but doesn't stay there because why would you want to stay there um so anyway that's sort of my, my my take on it i think electronic culture has really helped sort of revolutionize what we define as as um as art by removing the high and the low and doesn't mean it's all flat it means it's a network it means it's a bricolage uh, a pastiche um but then of course that's like the i won't even get into that and in sort of the economic cap late capitalism critiques of pastiche and stuff. It's interesting. It gets very complicated the later on we get in the 20th century, these kinds of conversations. So, I, I just want to say in relation to the, the theory thing, it seems to me like the, um, the, the, the thing in integral of saying the map and the territory feels like really relevant to green. Like in many ways, it sums up some of the, it reminds me of the division of like the big three like uh, in in the orange, kind of the map and the territory is really quite fused, and then uh, green kind of separates that, but basically says there isn't really any territory. Um, like uh, Jeremy, when you're talking about like the the kind of um, there's a really useful thing in art of like bringing beauty out of, as you say, these out of the the top and the hierarchy, and saying that even like low stuff can be beautiful. But then ultimately, there's this kind of what start as a useful destruction ends up in just being like, oh yeah, no, we're just against anything higher or anything against the map. And then at integral, it's kind of um, reunited again. So it's kind of like there is, to me, that that's just like really simple way of seeing how there's no integral without, uh, without green. Mm -hmm. And maybe even this, um, the beauty, the kind of implicated beauty of remixed art um, that, that takes the 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 refuse and the and the the trash heap and then forms it finds beauty in it and and associates that beauty and is able to draw it out um is a kind of integral oriented impulse you know like without even realizing it this you know that that kind of style of art in the way that art typically kind of foreshadows um you know a, a move in in, in cultural evolution 
um, I kind of see, you know, this sort of networked vision of art as this harbinger towards big picture thinking again and, and bringing together out of this sort of de deconstructed fragmentation of society, these new associations that have this sort of um, larger reality that are not quite the same as the mental and the orange version of big picture. They are more nuanced and complex and they seem to have integrated and, and sort of understood the green impulse of deconstruction. And then they just turn it around, right? And then build something out of all the deconstructed fragments. So in some way, I kind of see art doing that as a foreshadowing of this sort of future, these future forms of knowledge when we're connecting the dots again. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet, obviously, with the embattlement in, in academia right now. But I think there's an urge for it. I think there's a desire for it. And um, just of what we've seen the past few years with this sort of, sort of social, cultural, warfare everybody's at each other's throats online you know i think we're getting tired of this sort of oppositional fragmentation um that's so that's so kind of you know ryan and i were talking about that like the history of of perspectivalism in the mental age its strength is just, you know making the cut and ratio and on uh, earlier on it's it's actually helpful to get a foundation into the spatial real world the objective world but later on it becomes it, it becomes immoderate and can it keeps deconstructing itself it sort of yeah. turns that engine on itself and then it gets into the sort of um, disarray where there is no sort of up or down anymore and um, you're kind of in, in this in-between space between the perspectival and the perspectival and it seems really kind of dizzying right um so that's sort of i feel like we're there you know everybody's sort of fragmented and opposing each other and taking some essentialized stance which is sort of bringing back the deficient magical you know which is all about the point you know the sort of totalizing point so the mental kind of reverts back into the deficient magical um so yeah i think we're, 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 we're we want it because we're dealing with the illnesses of of all of these deficient structures you know um, so anyway, I'm, I'm just rambling, but I think networks and, and remix culture is a good vision of like the stylism of future forms of thinking and being. There was some. Um... Okay. The, uh, what I want to just add, to add, and what you are saying is this is possible because of Queen, because of the mm -hmm. merits of Queen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking about like, there's so much fun to pastiche like combining things and there was um i think i'm going to massacre your words jeremy but i was watching the interview you did with ryan um and there was this contrast or, or this like um similarity between like someone landing on the moon they put their thumb up and they can blot out the entire planet and that being like symbolically similar to an iphone or whatever like we have you have the world at the at the touch of your your finger and i think like there is something beautiful about pastiche of being able to combine all this stuff like some like energetic connections like i guess this is a kind of a bit self-aggrandizing but not really because i just slapped it on i don't necessarily consider consider it up but like when uh in um damiano's platform like me and ryan were just messing around and i just slapped ken wilber's face onto <laughs> uncle sam and it was funny how like i wouldn't I mean, I guess you can call it art, but I think a useful thing that Greens need to like consider is, I wouldn't call it good art, but there was like a great pleasure in just combining um, those two worlds. And there is something like really kind of incredible about like green pastiche. So I think of like rap music where they just like pulled from like so much blues and soul and all this kind of stuff. And these days probably almost anything and everything. And um I think that could be that could be done with like an integral sensibility about like the depth, like just because you sling a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. together and call it music doesn't make it so. But there there have there have been like loads of really incredible um, kind of pastiches. I think it speaks to something. I think that really comes alive at integral. There's like mm -hmm. there's something about having access to a lot of different energy and like seeing loads of different options to be able to combine them. That I think is um yeah I don't know I I just feel jazzed even. I almost want like another conversation about pastiche and art and all this kind of stuff because it just feels kind of energetically uh, exciting and things. Mm -hmm. It yeah, makes and, me think of oh, Ryan. Uh, sorry. <laughs> no, I was going to say next week we will talk about integral. I see us going away from green for quite a while. So <laughs> uh, I don't know if this is uh, important, Jeremy, say it, and then I would go into the closing round because we have 10 minutes and then, okay. Uh, just just a brief comment just on on the kind of um 
loading dock for <laughs> for jumping off of green is is um, understanding these networks and ecologies and and permaculture is a good example of that, right? It's a regenerative regenerative system, and it and it integrates deconstruction and decomposition as part of this whole larger process. So um, I think green is, is really, it's in that kind of ambivalence between deconstruction and then regrowing um, and the desire to regrow, maybe not having all the tools yet for that, but um, it's sort of latent in, in what we were talking about here. This, this, the deconstruction creates this network and then out of that network, human beings are always so creative. They're going to draw out these bigger pictures again and, and, and so on. So anyway, that, that's, that's my point. My culture is, is, Really cool. Do, Heidi, is there time for me to take a minute for a, a, a recapping moving out of green or not? Let's do the moving out of green that next time because we are uh, we are doing integral. I would say integral generally, not go the other levels because we might not have so big experience about the higher levels, but put it all together as integral. And I think this is the right place to 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 see the strategies how to get into integral. I would more uh, like you to um, to do a sort of a summary for, for the green, but what you learned out of what we said today and uh, at the end, maybe another short uh, exercise by Natalie or by whoever wants to propose it. Okay, is that okay for you, Karen? Yeah, I think for my checking out on the green is the, uh, and hearing the conversation, um, it reminds me that the root of moving into the green stage came out of the parallel universe, you might say, that the cultural movement and rebellions in the 60s and the economic and the fight for justice were parallel, they weren't integrated. And to integrate that, I'm wondering if that has a lot to do about some of the, um, negative in the green. And, and then of course the other thing is the green emergence of uh, a massive assault uh, by the, um, the blue forces uh, to the point of genocide. And we've literally had many of our colleagues literally shot down in the streets by the police uh, for being part of this whole movement in the 60s. It was not a Sunday school picnic at all. The struggle that went on during that time you know, and, um, the, you know, I mean, some people are just coming out of solitary confinement of 35 years uh, and so forth. So I think that this, the, for me, the appreciation of the green is also about the, um, the price that was paid and the heroicness and the courage uh, uh, so that it still kind of inspires me that we could stand up to move towards a much more diverse and multiple culture and more equal opportunity for all. Uh, so I, I still um, applaud um, the, the, the forces that were part of them bringing into the stage, stage and development of, of the green. What this brought, conversation brought together for me was the appreciation of moving into green because uh, some of us here lived it. The beauties, the wonder, the heroicness, the, the, the incredible uh, idealism and the opening up to so many new potentials, you know, breaking out of the constraints of the earlier stages and moving through it. And then the darker sides coming up but I, 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 at the same time, there is this sense that, well, if all of our ideas of everything are just maps and no map is more valid than the other, and it was kind of like it pulled the ground out from under many people. Uh, and even leading up to the 60s, something as a cultural historian I, I had identified now makes sense to me, this existential angst in the cultural expressions of Western 20th century art, um, T.S. Eliot's poetry, you know, we are the hollow men, we are the empty men, um, uh, um, waiting for Godot, where they, we, their existentialism that says there is no meaning, and we are meaning making creatures, but there is no meaning. And this terrific anxiety expressed in the play Waiting for Godot, for instance, or the end of Rocky Horror Picture Show, which is one of the great cultural expressions of the 20th century, I think. The, the punchline of Rocky Horror Picture Show is 
and crawling on the planet's face, an insect called the human race, lost in time, lost in space, and lost in meaning, meaning. And this is the price we have paid for green, the breaking free of the earlier constraints. It opened us to so many possibilities, but it leaves us with these atomized alienation. And I think green is the height of alienation and the height of loneliness, existential angst that we begin to put back together in something larger. And so this, this is my summation of the bouncing off point for green. Um, I was just thinking, I suppose it seems like a theme, like it so often seems like uh, the start of a stage is, is like the most exciting, than the, is it, which I suppose makes sense, like you get to the end and it's kind of the ass end. But I was thinking of like how good green and bad green are like almost the, the opposites. Like um, I'm thinking of it, what you just said, Karen, of like meaning. Like I think if like Hendrix and the Beatles and Rolling Stones and like Malcolm X and all these kind of people had this idea that like things did a mouth that things weren't meaningful um they never would have got what 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 they actually did and it kind of seems to me like so much of the cultural movement in the 60s was about incredible meaning you know it was about kind of love and coming together and ending war um as opposed to the kind of nihilism you see now with the, in modern art they don't really believe anything and everything's like deconstructing mm -hmm. um you know it literally gets to the point of like celebrating um the most kind of um ugly and all this stuff i think also there's a contrast to me of like you know these days sjw these kind of like spineless snowflakes that insist that everybody cater to their childish whims as opposed to um these massive issues that they were originally dealing with um i was kind of appreciating jeremy bringing in the you know t two world wars and the nazis like you needed some some serious grit like there were some serious massive issues for green uh to deal with and people like really needed to um karen you mentioned um be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves i mean the whole what do they call it non-violent protest well, that kind of thing like they had so much grit to it and and again with the opposites because what i see with the sjw's is they're kind of the opposite to that they're happy to be violent happy to be ridiculous on any like childish whim so um yeah i find it really useful call to separate the the good and the bad of green um because it's so it's so needed and the i think i sort of enjoyed it because i think because there's a lot of crap in green these days it's so nice to be reminded why green was such an incredible movement and why there's like so much uh so much to celebrate about it yeah Um, I really appreciate bringing in the history and art and culture that you all have done. That's not something that's on my radar as much when I think of some of these stages. Um, and the thing that stands out for me with Green is how important it is to um, have that anchor of making a point while still being able to accept other points in Healthy Green. And um, I feel like that's uh, the difference, one of the differences in the pre-trans fallacy later on that we know who we are, there's something to anchor us in. And in the pre-trans stage, that's like the uh, magenta version of green, um, we're more you know, undifferentiated, lost in the sea of possibilities, and we don't necessarily choose one thing out of the many to value in particular. And that's, I feel like, part of what supports us in transitioning the second tier also. Um, and a way to sum that up um, that I've heard in some diversity trainings around here in Portland is um, cultivating healthy green by understanding the difference between impact and intent. Unhealthy green has great positive intent. We don't necessarily think about the impact, the context of how this is landing. And healthy green has the awareness of those impacts and supports us in transitioning into second year also. For me, it was now a real big insight, um, especially what you said at the end, Karen, because this existential angst, this existential feeling like nobody, uh, I didn't connect it with that, with Queen. And I wasn't aware of that. I was aware in my personal life of Queen as a 
natural, um, how do you say, ecological movement as, a, as an aspiration of that. But all my life it has uh, been present, this existential quest. Who am I? What, what, what sense does it make? You know? and, uh, and then also bringing in you, uh, Jeremy, the, the world war. And I really am still very much in, in the quest of that because my parents have lived it through and I'm born not, not much later. I mean, so I see, see that also as my cultural inheritance and I never got these things together. And that's really, I'm very grateful for, uh, for this conversation. That's, it's, I s seem to connect the dots. So thank you. I think for me, um, I don't really have much to add in terms of, uh, of summing up things that we've learned. I think it's, it's been um, very helpful and insightful to get everyone's perspective, uh, especially me as a millennial age individual who did not live through the beginning of um, this stage of, of the green. Um, you know, I, I think it, it really brings in the crucial point for me that um, f cultural fragmentation and isolation that Karen was talking about um, it is really one of these key um, challenges we need to learn somehow to overcome, you know, this, this sort of feeling of separation uh, this feeling of sort of a, an isolated ego cut off from everybody else in war with everybody else, um, which is at sort of the heart of so much tension and anxiety right now. And um, I think it really kind of reaches a point, literally it reaches a point <laughs> of deconstruction and dissolution where um, it highlights the importance of building meshworks and ecologies of meaning um, and working towards these sort of emergent holes that we are we want to learn how to articulate in both knowledge and in our lived lives so just grateful for you all ronald were you gonna were you gonna say something or fine Oh, I. Uh, oh, Roland has uh, Ronald has already started. Oh, okay. around, so it's you. Yeah. You're the last. <laughs> oh, I think you're just clearing. <laughs> thank your you for waiting. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone. This has been really interesting. I. It's funny because I, I have a lot of interest in um, postmodernism and philosophy, but that's not really appropriate for everyone to discuss. Uh, I mean, because it's so technical, so I didn't bring it up. And I have a lot of interest in talking about like race and social justice topics, but not so much at seven in the morning on Sunday. <laughs> so maybe we'll table that for a crossfire or something. But um, uh, I just want to end by mentioning the crossfire. Um, uh, so, so the plan, according to the doodle poll, thank you everyone for filling that out. Um, that will be from uh, 10 to 1130 on Thursday morning, uh, or 10 to, 10 to 1130 Pacific Standard Time. Um, and so that's time that worked best for everyone who filled out the poll. Um, so I, I think that for the first session, I'd like to start off and, and that will be this Thursday, last Thursday, I, w I was interviewing Jeremy, so we didn't do it, but, um, this Thursday, uh, will be the first one. And I thought we could start it out by talking about a little bit about having just a little discussion of what this is going to be about and some of the ground rules and guidelines that, um, me and, and, uh, other people like Paul have been kind of discussing and brainstorming and I'd like to hear everyone else's input on what, what they see this being uh, for them. And I'm going to invite my friend, uh, unfortunately Damiano's not here right now, but he wanted to debate the topic of free will. He said he was really excited about. And uh, one of my other friends, Charles Markser, who is, uh, was on the debate team in high school and college and is a, a retired philosopher, said he would debate Damiano on free will. I think that'd be absolutely hilarious. I'm gonna have my popcorn ready uh, for that one. So hopefully if Damiano can make it on Thursday, then I think that that'll be what we're gonna run with. And uh, so yeah, I look forward to seeing you Thursday from 10 to 11.30 Pacific Standard Time. Okay, with that, this Sunday is gone. And if you want to, to do it a little later, if, they can, if we can, we can also change this, the Sunday time, so.
That's something that I would love this time on, in the mornings. My brain does not work very well. <laughs> <laughs> so we might uh, talk about that again. Uh, but now for next week, let it is still in the same position. And then uh, we, we try to find something else. Okay. And let's meet on Thursday for Ryan's uh, crossfire. Um, yeah, let me know. Shall, shall we do it on my Zoom or is somebody else's? I will be there. That would be great, Heidi, if we could do it with you okay. again. Good. Send out the link again. So, see you next week for Integral. Oh, what, is our top, what is our topic next week? Are we going to do second tier? Yeah, second tier, I would say. Yeah. And then finally, what well, everyone's some, been waiting for. We still have some <laughs> insight, but third tier, then I would say, is only speculation, I, I believe at least. So, uh, I would leave it with second tier at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Next week. See you all. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.